This morning I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes telling you how BT is using Hadoop to deliver this. Um, this is our BT on a page slide. Uh, when Gavin Patterson, our CEO, uh, announced our full year results to the city this morning, this is the slide that he uses to explain what we're about. Uh, so as it's Gavin's slide, I naturally think it's a really, really good slide. If I didn't, it could become suddenly career limiting. So. Anyway, um, I'm not going to go through all of it. It has on the things that you know about BT. So uh, we do fiber to the curb and to uh, broadband. We're now a TV company, so we have premiership rights. We compete head to head with Sky. We're going to be doing Champions League. If you're into soccer or football, you'll be seeing that this autumn. Um, we are now back in the mobile space. So we have a SIM-only MVNO proposition, and unless you've been living under a rock, you'll know that we'll soon be acquiring EE, the UK's largest 4G network provider. Um, and we do it through those pillars in the middle, investing for growth, transforming our costs. But today I'm going to focus on these two aspects of our strategy, broadening and deepening our customer relationships, and doing that in UK business markets. So, uh, as well as dealing with consumers, and we're a major supplier to business in the UK and around the world, and to broaden and deepen those customer relationships, you do that by meeting customer expectations. So, when you phone BT, you hope, you expect that we know who you are when you call, what services you have, how you're connected to the network, how those services are performing, and when you take a day off work for us to come and install ultra fast, uh, super fast broadband, you expect our engineer from OpenReach to turn up on time and not be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Most of the time we get it right. Okay, So in the last quarter we extended the uh, network by another half a million super fast broadband customers. But occasionally we don't get it right and that's often because our customer data is not right. So let's have a, a moment to think about our uh, customers. So some of you will know these people from people in the UK. These are uh, Adam and Jane, our fictitious family that we ran over a couple of years. And they're like any other family. They meet, they fall in love, they get married. They have children who leave home and go and share flats. Uh, and all of that churn and change we have to keep track of. Moving house, changing name, changing credit card, changing emails. Uh, if you get one of those wrong in five million, you're going to miss one of those expectations. Now, we're pretty good at doing that for consumer customers, and anyway, it's a legal responsibility. Under the Data Protection Act, you must keep your personal customer data accurate, and we, we try very hard to meet that requirement. But for business customers, it gets much harder. So uh, remember our strategy or our talk today is looking at um, a single view of those business customers, so let's look at uh, what, what that life cycle looks like for a business customer. Now, it would be indiscreet of me to put up one of our business customers' family trees. So I'm illustrating what a typical large corporate uh, business life cycle looks like using our own family tree. And the events, the equivalent of the births, deaths, and marriages in, in the business world are the mergers and acquisitions, the joint ventures, the sell-offs, and occasionally the insolvencies. And you have to keep track of all of that in a customer master file. In about 1998, um, we created a, a system we call CMF, customer master file, and it was a classic ETL batch processing system. Uh, it takes in uh, data from Dun & Bradstreet who track all of the new, customer, the new enterprises in the UK, uh, and it merges those with our existing uh, data sets. Now, um, there's 2.8 million customers or active businesses trading in that Dun & Bradstreet file. And of course, you know, being an old company, we've managed to spread our customer data over 12 different significant customer databases. So every day we have a massive ETL job. It's nearly a billion records that have to be compared and contrasted to reconcile the updates and ensure that all of the systems are up to date. And um, by uh, 2002, a couple of years ago, um, Customer Master File was a teenager, and it had teenager issues. It was on the wrong um, COTS package, the wrong ETL package we wanted to phase out. It was on hardware that was end of service life. It was in a data center we wanted to close. You get the picture. 
Uh, it wasn't processing all the data. There was new data the business wanted to, to process, and it was taking 24 hours to process 24 hours worth of data. So it had a lot of problems. So we saw the investment proposal to uh, replatform that back onto another relational database. And I sat down with some colleagues, and we said, you know what? That thing would work on Hadoop. It's a basically a data velocity problem. We need to process that data faster and increase the volume. So if you look at uh, CMF in a bit more detail, again, I'll not go into the detail, but you can see it's a multi-stage ETL pipeline. We go around it every day, and we publish that customer master file, and it goes back out to those 12 systems as the database of record. Okay. So to cut a long story short, uh, we put a, worked with Cloudera, put a, put a production cluster together. We went from PowerPoint to production in nine months, which is pretty good by our standards. And the net result is we now have achieved a velocity increase of a factor of 15. So the data cycle now takes eight hours, and we process five times the amount of data. Now, the business sponsor doesn't know it runs on a Hadoop, and frankly, they don't care. All they know is now they're working with today's data rather than yesterday's data. And also, we saved them a lot of money. The putting it on Hadoop was much cheaper than doing it as a standalone system. So they're very, very happy. So that's just what we're doing in terms of, uh, that was our first use case. We, we picked a very simple, we wanted a stable solution. That's why it's MapReduce, it's Java MapReduce. It's not terribly Spark or, or, or data science-y. But that was just so we could get a production capability up and running. Um, uh, and there's a lot of work in doing that in a company like BT. So first you got persuade somebody to let you put some hardware in a data center. These are photos from our Sheffield data center. Uh, that's our current cluster. It's not that big by industry standards. It's only about 50 nodes, and we haven't yet filled it up. And that's the team that built it in the middle. So really, they get most of the credit. Adam, Billums, Biddy, Simon, and Rob. Uh, a couple of other guys, Rob and Simon, who are at the conference today, also were key players in putting that. So very much a team effort. Uh, and they are the same guys that run our estate of nearly 35,000 Linux servers, okay? So we didn't hire in a bunch of Hadoopy experts. We took some of the world's best Unix admins and upskilled them into how to run Hadoop. And they thought that was great. They get new skills. They're very happy with that. Um, and they don't, uh, they just do that on top of their ex existing day job. This week, they're in the process of doing our upgrade from 4.8 to 5.3 on the production clusters. So, so that was our kind of first platform and our first use case, and that's been up and running for about a, a year now. And uh, well now, of course, that uh, gives us the right to develop a project pipeline and put more stuff, because it's a multi-tenant platform. Um, we started with that MapReduce and, and that simple one, because uh, Claire, who's our CFO, said, big data is big hype. We don't believe you. Uh, don't you come back in here unless you deliver a return on investment and that project better work for the customer. And that's what we did in less than a year. We think our IOA is between 200 and 250%. So um, some of these projects, so you probably recognize that's the Home Hub 5. That's what delivers most of the UK. It's, it's broadband. Uh, and we have a new project called Ultrafast Broadband. It's the next generation. We run a program called NGA2, Next Generation Access 2. And that will take you from 40 or 80 meg, depending on which variant of infinity you're on, to 300 meg and possibly slightly beyond. But whether you can get that service is very dependent on how long your copper is, how good the copper is, how many joints are in the copper is, um, and we need to do a lot of very detailed network analysis. You can imagine uh, 24 million homes, individual wire segments connecting you to the exchange. That's a lot of data to compare and and contrast. So we have to get all the inventory with all of the performance and test data and join that up and figure out who is it. Because we don't want to deliver you a product and then you to say, I'm not getting 300 meg. We want to be certain that you get that speed. So, um, uh, The next one we're working on is um, so relating TV performance to the underlying network performance. And this is, this is about data silos. T today that data has been kept separate. So when you get pixelation on TV or, or the screen freezes right when Wayne Rooney kicks the goal, um, uh, that's normally caused by some low-level error in the network. And we're trying to bring those data sets together, and we can improve that TV performance. Because we want to roll out 4K and all of the extra channels for Champions League. Uh, we're working on something called uh, 4G in a home hub, so a thing called a femtocell. So today, your mobile phones are locked onto one of those big masts. What we're going to do is shrink one of those, 
and stick it in the home hub. And when you go into your house, you will have not a Wi-Fi connection onto the hub, but a 4G full-on mobile connection going back over that connection. Um, so that means instead of managing sort of you know 70 to 80,000 base stations around the UK, we have to manage 5 million tiny base stations, one in every home. That's an awful lot of telemetry data, and previously it probably wouldn't have been cost effective for us to do that efficiently. But with something like Hadoop, then we can say, yeah, if you want all the telemetry, hundreds of measures every 10 minutes for millions of devices, suddenly these figures don't become scary or, or cost uh, too expensive. And of course, Internet of Things. So we're already doing some work with Milton Keynes Council, something called MK Smart. If you park a car, there's an app it, you can download, and it will help guide you to the nearest free parking space. And that's all about censoring up very, very dull things like dustbins and parking spaces. But those are just the individual projects. I thought I'd leave you with this slide. So you have to have a vision to make you know you're going in the right direction. And as an architect, I like to have a set of principles which guide me. So don't go away with the thought that we have nine operational systems in BT. We have more like 1,900, and we have several of the world's largest uh, data warehouses. But this is how we're introducing Hadoop. So the important thing there, single Hadoop platform below our operational systems, our existing systems extending their data into Hadoop using it initially for storage, so simple transition that, that they can understand, and then exposing that data through uh, Hive meta tables so that you can share that data and we have all of our data assets in one place. Um, and of course, on commodity hardware, the security has to be as good as our business as usual security, full Windows AD integration, and the operational SLA around it has to be as good as our existing systems and IT infrastructure in the state. And that's it. That's our little story with uh, Hadoop. That's where we're at today. Maybe I'll come back and talk about what we're doing with Spark in a, in a year or two's time. But I hope you enjoyed that and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much.